cloud. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Can the audience hear? The audience can hear me. Good at projecting. Okay. So, so first, welcome everybody in person. A welcome to everybody who is on Zoom. Our speaker, as you can see, is on Zoom today. It's great to be back together. Excuse us for any little glitches. We're kind of learning our way with this owl Zoom hybrid stuff. And those of you who've been here for a while can tell. Um, I want to thank Brenda Harrington, who's sitting over here and the library for hosting this. It's really great to be able to be back here in the Abbott room. So if you're if you're on Zoom, please mute yourself. And please, if you have questions during the presentation, put them in the chat and they will be monitored by Corliss Davis, who is also on Zoom. <coughs> Zoom questions in the room, we'll handle here in the room. Um, our speaker today, who I'm very happy to introduce, is Andy Brand, who is Director of Horticulture at the Coastal Maine Botanical Garden in Blue Bay, and he will be discussing the events of landscaping with native plants. So I hope you all enjoy this lecture. He has um, spectacular pictures, I can tell you that. And uh, Andy, take it away. Okay. Um, everybody can hear me? Yes. Sounds good. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here and to be talking about one of my favorite subjects, native plants, and not just how beautiful they are, but how beneficial they are to increasing the biodiversity um, in our landscapes. And what I hope to do is just go through a, a series of, of slides, some perennials, and then some woody plants, um, and just highlight the beauty of some of them and then focus on a couple in particular the, um, the insect life that they attract um, some pretty amazing creatures we have right here in our backyards so just to give you a little bit of background about myself um, born and raised in connecticut and worked for 27 years at broken arrow nursery down in hamden connecticut which is just north of new haven uh, where I was the manager of the nursery. Um, and it was a small nursery that specialized in rare and unusual trees and shrubs from around the world, um, both native and non-native plants. And then in 2018, I, was, um, I took the job as plant curator at Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens, and my wife and I moved up to Bristol, uh, Maine, and I've been here since. And, and Last November, I was um, selected to be director of horticulture. And it's been a lot of fun um, moving from the commercial side of horticulture into the uh, public horticulture realm. It's been a, a great opportunity for, for me and my family. We, I've been vacationing in this region since I was a little boy. So it's kind of nice to finally call this area of Maine my home. I'm also, as you're gonna find out, a big nature person and try to get out as often as I can to, to look everywhere, um, whether it's hiking here in the woods of Maine, but also trying when the opportunity arises to, to travel abroad and um, go see wildlife and nature in other parts of the world. Um, you can see in the top left, I, I do like to kind of, what I encourage people to do is slow down and really observe your surroundings. You know, we are so eager to get from point A to point B in as you know, shortest amount of time as possible that we often overlook some pretty amazing things. And if we just take the time and look more closely, you know, at flowers that we, you know, see every day that you may see some pretty fascinating insects, whether they're butterflies or who knows what, um, but it just means taking a little slower pace with our lives. 
So moving on to our, our talk about native plants, you know, there's a lot of definitions of what native plants are. And for today's lecture, the one that I'm going to be going with is that a native plant is one that has been growing in a particular area prior to European settlement. So there hasn't been any, you know, manipulation by humans at all with these plants that they've been here since anybody came, set foot on this, on this land. The plants we're going to look at today um, mainly are going to be from the Northeast region, you know, with New England, but also New York, Pennsylvania. But then there will be a few that I'm going to highlight that come from Mid-Atlantic uh, region, Delaware, Virginia, um, Maryland, those regions, but are perfectly hardy in our, our climate setting. So, you know, the interest in native plants has really um, grown immensely in the past few years, particularly in the past five to 10 years. Um, you know, and there, there are many reasons why native plants are important. You know, for the most part, they tend to be very low maintenance. Um, they require less pesticides, you know, because with native plants, you know, one of our main goals with planting them is to increase biodiversity. So we really don't want to be spraying them with pesticides because then that'll be uh, removing, eliminating the insects and things we're trying to attract. Um, once they're established, they tend to be um, more drought resistant, which is a big thing, particularly the last, just the past summer, what we've had, uh, you know, very little water up until recently, um, you know, as far as rain. And it's, it's been interesting here at the gardens to see how our native plants have been doing, you know, in our surrounding woods, um, where they're getting no no additional water, which, you know, the, the gardens themselves do get. And the native plants, you know, some are showing some signs of, of wilting and all, but, you know, overall they're looking quite well. Um, for me, the biggest thing with native plants is they provide food and habitat for wildlife. And more importantly, they increase and sustain biodiversity. And, you know, our, if our landscapes are more, have more biodiversity, it's gonna support um, well-functioning ecosystems. And then as we're gonna see, you know, many of our native plants, majority of them have some very beautiful attributes. All right, so let's start off looking at some perennials. And it's interesting when I put this together, I could probably put this same talk together with a completely different set of slides um, many, many times over. There are just so many great native plants. And this is just the group that, um, I was particularly fond of that the evening I, I put this together. So um, we're going to start off with one of my favorite groups of plants, and those are the milkweeds, the Asclepias. Um, and what I like about milkweeds and Asclepias is there is a species of Asclepias that fits pretty much any habitat we may have in our, our landscape. Um, you know, the common milkweed that you see here, Asclepias syriaca, that's not necessarily one that many people are gonna put in their yards because it, it does spread from rhizomes and um, can be somewhat aggressive. It's more suited for meadows, uh, edge of a woods, that type of a setting, full sun to part shade, um, wonderful, sweet smelling umbels of flowers that you see here, um, high in nectar, very, very rich in as a food source for our pollinators and butterflies in particular. Um, here you see a, a group of coral hair streak butterflies that, you know, there are five of them here, you know, just drinking away at the nectar that these, these flowers are providing. As I said, it has a really wonderful fragrance, um, but it does need space. It, it's not suited for like necessarily a perennial border. Um, we struggle with it here in some of our gardens where we're constantly having to um, remove the suckering stems just to contain it into a particular area. Um, but as you drive around the local roads, you're for certain you're going to notice this um, when it's in flower in, in fields growing with different types of grasses and, and other uh, herbaceous material. Here's one that actually prefers partial shade. This is the Pope milkweed. This is um, somewhat limited as far as its range here in Maine, uh, more to western and southern parts of Maine. This is the um, Asclepius exultata. What I love with this is the fact that it does um, like part shade. Most Asclepius want full sun to really do best. Um, it grows four or five feet tall. 
Um, but what I like is the, rather than that really tight umbel of flowers, it has a much more graceful um, umbel of flowers. It looks to me, it almost resembles like um, some of those um, fireworks that they shoot up and then they cascade down out of the sky, the way that the, each individual flower is held in that inflorescence. And this is a really wonderful uh, plant. It's slow to spread. It's not super vigorous like the one we just previously saw. Um, but again, because it likes partial shade, it makes it pretty unique. As the name implies, swamp milkweed, typically you're gonna find this in, in moist soils, wet soils, but that said, it does fine in average garden soils. Um, we have it here growing around our butterfly and moth house and it gets some supplemental wiring, but it's pretty much basic soils, nothing fancy. It tends to be adaptable to those that are damp and wet, to those that are a little bit more on the drier side. Typical flower color is pink, and there are some white cultivars available. This is one called Ice Ballet. Height-wise, um, probably three, three and a half feet, um, and it is clump forming. Probably my favorite is the butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. I, I love this. This is a clump forming plant as well. Full sun is ideal for this plant. Just vivid, vivid orange flowers, um, maybe two feet tall, super adaptable. It grows well in average garden soils, but also um, it's been known to do pretty well in some heavy clay soils as well. The thing to remember, it does put down a pretty substantial tap root, so it's not really happy when people try to move it after it's been established for many years. Um, it can be done. You just have to dig very deep to get that as much of that taproot as possible to reduce the amount of shock that the plant will go through. But here's again that coral hair streak butterfly um, nectaring on the butterfly weed. And if you look, this is another thing when you look closely at these butterflies, just the beauty of them. See the, the black and white banding on the antennae and legs, and then just how closely the orange in the wing matches the orange of the flower. But this is why everybody's encouraged to grow some form of milkweed. We want to encourage um, the increase in populations of monarch butterflies. This is a mature monarch butterfly caterpillar eating milkweeds. As most of you probably are aware, monarchs will only survive and feed on milkweeds. Occasionally their, leg, their eggs do get laid on plants that are in the same family. Unfortunately, the caterpillars cannot survive on those plants. They will only survive on different types of Asclepius. There is the very familiar adult. Um, and then just something that's kind of unique, you know, we, we associate monarchs with milkweed, but also a whole slew of characters that you can see on milkweeds, different types of beetles, uh, milkweed tussock moth caterpillar in the bottom of the screen. That is a, a moth um, that lays numerous eggs on the milkweed and you'll get a whole grouping of these little fuzzy caterpillars uh, feeding on your milkweed. Um, and then people are probably very familiar with this uh, beetle as well. Um, the interesting thing is you notice that they're all very brightly colored. And that is because they're not as concerned as other insects about being eaten because they are eating the milkweed, which has very toxic um, chemicals in that white sap. So they ingest those chemicals, making them distasteful. Thus, when birds try to eat these creatures, they quickly learn that it's not something they want to necessarily go back and try to get. So the bright colors, um, they don't have to be as concerned uh, protecting themselves, whether it's feeding on the underside of the leaf or being a green color to kind of conceal themselves from a potential predator. One of my favorite early um, nectar sources for butterflies and moths and other pollinators is wild geranium, geranium maculatum. You'll see this growing along roadsides. It does really well in kind of partial shade, uh, edge of a wood setting, but also um, I've seen it in, in full sun meadows. I'm doing well. It does reseed, so that's something to keep in mind if you do have it in your gardens. Um, but they're easy to, to pull out the seedlings. Uh, I just love that lavender flower. And, you know, it tends to start flowering here in May uh, when many of our butterflies are, are starting to emerge, our, our early species. And it's just a great early source of nectar 
um, for these species. Here you see kind of a, a unique um, moth. This is a day flying moth. You know, most moths fly at night, but there are some exceptions. This one doesn't have, unfortunately, have a common name, um, but I frequently will find this beautiful moth nectaring on the geranium maculatum. And the geranium typically will grow 18 to 20 inches tall, um, has wonderful geranium like foliage. The only, if there is a downside, is it's seeding and it's reseeding. Um, so that's just, again, keep that in mind. Some of our um, smaller early butterflies really like that. It's a perfect size flower for things like this um, skipper butterfly that you see here, nectaring. You can see it's proboscis, this black straw-like um, instrument it's using to lap up the nectar. This is one more from the southeastern mid-Atlantic region. This is Jeffersonia diphylla or twin leaf. And this is one of my favorite um, woodland plants. This loves rich, woodsy, humusy soils. Um, this is a spring ephemeral. So it, it emerges in the spring flowers, puts out a nice foliage, and then come mid to later summer, it's gone dormant. Um, you see the reason it's called twin leaf. You see how the individual leaf is kind of divided almost in half into these what most resemble somewhat like angel wings. Um, it's a clump forming plant that'll get approximately 15 to 18 inches tall and wide. See these wonderful white um, flowers that are approximately an inch to an inch and a quarter or so across. And then it has a very unique uh, seed structure here that you see in the left-hand side. And if you can see in this picture, you see this where my cursor is, there's like a, a line that comes through. And what happens when the seeds are emerged, this almost, this area here opens up kind of like a cap. And then that pops open. And then there's just a cluster of really beautiful brown seeds that then are dispersed as the wind blows these, um, these stems around the seeds are then knocked out uh, and then distributed to the ground. Really beautiful plant um, for like the, the woodland, you know, mixes well with things like ferns and geraniums and epimediums, other woodland plants, hostas, things like that. Here shows you the rich woodsy soils and the kind of the habit of the plant. You see all the oak leaves, it's a perfect kind of acidy soils are wonderful. I'm always asked, you know, plants for birds, and you know, we'll see some later on, um, some berry producing plants, but you know, everybody loves hummingbirds and to attract hummingbirds to our yards. And you know, Lobelia cardinalis, cardinal flower is one of the best. You know, those bright fire engine red flowers just scream in the summertime, you know, and you'll see this in the wild growing along streams, rivers, pond edges. And it does prefer those types of habitats. It likes moist soils to really do well. You'll see it on little hummocks in, in streams and rivers, little islands, things like that. Um, and it's preferred, um, but it, it is adaptable. It'll take some drier soils and still do, still do well. Um, I think drier soils is not gonna get quite as tall, um, but you know, you get these really majestic wands of flowers that start flowering from the the base of that wand and then flowers you can see um, here the flowers have gone by but then continue to open as you work your way up towards the terminus of the flower and fluorescence. But just a wonderful bright color here you see at the gardens with this backdrop this yellow you see here is a type of um, staghorn sumac called tiger eyes. Just wonderful contrast of colors. And here you see it in its native habitat and a, a local stream here and Noble Borough, Maine. One of our earliest flowering um, perennials, woodland perennials, or another spring ephemeral like the twin leaf is um, Sanguinaria canadensis, the bloodroot. Wonderful early, you know, and typically this will start sometime in April. It'll be opening with these very simple white um, daisy-like flowers with the yellow centers to them approximately six to eight inches tall. Um, what's neat about this plant, when they start to come up, the flower stems come up through the unfurling leaves. And it's thought that those unfurling leaves protect the stem, the flowering stem from like some of our, 
maybe the earlier uh, spring winds, you know, it, it kind of wraps, it almost gives the stem a hug. And then eventually the, the leaves continue to unfurl to this very interesting lobe shape that you see here. Um, flowers go by and then you still have this wonderful foliage to look at in the woodland garden. Um, and then eventually, as with the twin leaf, this will also go summer dormant. So it's just important with any of these spring ephemerals to be sure you have some sort of a tag or marking where these are so you don't accidentally think something has died there and you, you go ahead and plant something in its place, but then you know suddenly are reminded as you're digging up these, the roots of a plant. Um, so that's just a key thing with those spring ephemerals is to really be good about marking where they are. Here's the reason they call it blood root. If you dig up a, one of the rhizomes um, and snap it, it has a very bright orangey red sap uh, to the inside, thus the name blood root and sanguinaria, sanguine for blood uh, of the uh, genus name. And it does slowly spread and form nice patches. One thing you'll notice with blood root is it'll start popping up throughout your yard in areas you've never planted blood root before. And you can thank ants for that. Um, there is a structure on bloodroot seeds called naliosome, which is a little fleshy piece that's right on attached to the seed that ants love. So when the seeds fall to the ground, the ants quickly grab them, take the seeds back to their nests where they pull off the naliosome and feed it to their progeny. And then the um, the seeds then are dispersed by the ants around areas where you've never even planted a blood root. So that's, if you're wondering, gee, I've never planted something, you know, 15, 20 feet away from the original patch. It's the ants you can thank. You know, goldenrods often get a, a bad rap for being the cause of hay fever, you know, itchy eyes, runny noses, but it's actually ragweed that flies, that um, flowers at the same time as our, our goldenrods. Um, Goldenrod pollen is very heavy and drops to the ground, whereas ragweed uh, pollen is very light and blown around everywhere in the, in the air um, when we get any kind of a breeze. And that's what's really causing our, our issues. Um, but goldenrod's probably one of the best late season nectar sources for butterflies, moths, but particularly things like monarchs that you know, come October when goldenrods are starting to really do their, their full flower effect. Um, monarchs are looking for a lot of energy because they're gearing up to fly, you know, thousands of miles to Mexico where they're gonna overwinter and they need to store up and get as much energy as possible. So they're looking for these late season perennials like goldenrods, Joe pie weed, um, asters, things like that. So the more, different uh, the variety of flowers we can provide that time of year. We're helping out monarchs, but also many other types of pollinators. You know, things like this interesting um, juniper hair streak butterfly that flies late in the season and that's looking for uh, late season nectar sources. The thing to remember with goldenrods when you're like, if you go to a garden center is just read the label carefully. You know, there are some goldenrods that um, kind of run like that uh, Asclepius syriaca, the common milkweed. So they farm massive patches that are really not appropriate for many garden settings. Um, but there are many types of clump farming goldenrods like um, the blue goldenrod, uh, Solidago casea that actually does well in some part shade or zigzag goldenrod is another one. And there are several others that are more clump farming or very slow spreading that are more appropriate for perennial borders or uh, more garden settings as opposed to some that could take over an acre of land that you saw in the previous slide. Just, you know, beautiful things you can find on golden. This is a red banded hair streak. Um, here's an interesting, this is an Elanthus webworm moth. This actually came over with an invasive tree, the uh, tree of heaven, Elanthus, but just an amazing moth that you find late in the season, nectaring on goldenrods. But just to show you the importance of goldenrods, look at all the different types of insects that use goldenrod flowers, whether they're getting pollen or nectar, you know, flies, wasps, bees, uh, beetles too. These top right, these beetles, they're, you know, eating the pollen from the flowers. They're super, super beneficial 
perennial to have in our gardens if we have the space for to include some. Um, and you won't have allergies if you do so. I mean, who wouldn't want this beautiful caterpillar on our goldenrod feeding? This is a brown hooded owlet caterpillar. It's a type of moth when it, when it emerges as an adult. The moth is very boring looking. It's just kind of brownish, nondescript, but the caterpillar has almost every color of the rainbow on its body, yellow, purples, oranges, even some reds. And it feeds on goldenrods and asters. I can't stress to the importance of our native grasses. Um, particularly little blue stem is a favorite of mine. Um, as you see here, the beautiful silvery coloration you see this time of year when it's in flower and then gone to seed. Um, I encourage people to leave it up year round, you know, and through the winter and then early spring, um, cut it back to the ground and then let it come up. It's probably best with these grasses if you have the space to plant them in mass. You have a much better chance of attracting uh, many of these butterflies you see here um, to your yard and to lay eggs. These butterflies you see, they will only lay their eggs on different types of native grasses that we have. So if we don't have include native grasses in our landscapes, we are never going to see these butterflies in our yards necessarily, or they're not going to stick around. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind is, you know, it's fun to include lots of flowers because we love to see the adult butterflies, adult moths. Um, but if we want to keep and, and have those butterflies complete their life cycle, we need to include the host plants. And the host plants are those plants that the female butterflies seek out to lay their eggs on, and then the caterpillars subsequently feed on them. And an important thing to remember is that many of our butterflies are very selective as to what they will lay their eggs on. Um, they're not just gonna fly around and, you know, a female's thinking, oh, I've got to get rid of these eggs um, and lay on oak leaf or grass or maple or a hosta leaf. Many are very specific. Some so specific, it's only one type of plant like monarchs and, and milkweeds. That's a perfect example of a very specialized species. Full sun too is ideal for majority of our native grasses. There are some that will tolerate shade, but the majority of them like our little blue stems or big blue stems, our switchgrass, purple lovegrass, they all want full sun to do best. All right, let's shift gears now and look at some woody plants. And a couple of weeks ago, I was down on the Cape uh, giving a lecture um, and visiting some, some family and um, this bear berry is everywhere on the Cape and the, and the seashore. And it's a great plant for those hot, dry, sunny spots, um, perfect evergreen ground cover. Those are the ideal conditions. I love it, how it's used here where it's mixing with hay scented fern. So it's, it's kind of controlling the, the spread of the hay scented fern and just giving this wonderful low, you know, 10 to 11 inch, 12 inch, um, ground cover, just mat forming, slowly spreading, just, you know, perfect year round color. You see the flowers here, the lovely kind of blueberry like flowers that you see here on the, on the right. Very, very pretty with a slight pinkish cast. Attracts some of our early flying butterflies, such as this uh, white pine elephant. And then right now it's, they're covered with these bright red fruits that are very showy as well especially contrasting with that nice, rich, dark, shiny green foliage that you see here. Just to show you a couple examples of how it, you can find it scrambling over rocks. Um, you'll see it here in spots um, growing, you know, along some of our larger lakes, sometimes along the shore. Um, and it can tolerate some pretty harsh conditions. So that's something to keep in mind too. Here you see it used between a wall and um, a driveway. This is actually down in Massachusetts at Tower Hill Botanic Garden. Um, this is the fall color. It does kind of take on kind of a bronzy plum coloration, but you can see it's, it takes, um, you know, bright sun, pretty dry there. It probably gets snow dumped on it in the winter um, and still doing really wonderful and just a nice evergreen ground cover. 
Um, looking at a couple of different shrubs, um, the chokeberries. Uh, these are native shrubs to our region, often um, suggested as a, an alternative to burning bush, Euonymus miscellatus, which is a very invasive plant um, because of the fall color. This is a plant that can get six to eight feet tall, um, will slowly spread and form a um, kind of a small colony of stems, very upright growing shrub. Um, this is black chokeberry, Aronia melanocarpa. You see the really shiny black fruits that you see here. But it's one of the best native shrubs, in my opinion, for fall color. Fantastic fire engine reds and oranges um, that you see here. And that's, you can see why people would suggest planting this instead of Euonymus elatus. Full sun to really bring out this red fall color, but I often find this growing on the edge of a woods in some high canopy shade, and it's doing quite well in those settings as well. There is a, a red fruited form that's also native, not quite as common as the black for sure. This is the red chokeberry, Ronera beautifolia. Everything, the attributes are all the same. The only difference is the fruit color. So here you have bright, bright, shiny red fruits instead of the black fruits. Let's say you have a lot of water or a particular area in your yard that's always like in the spring gets inundated with water and the water sits there for a month or more. Um, nothing grows there. Most things don't like that. Button bush will do all right there. Often you'll find button bush um, in the wild um, growing with its stems in water um, on the edge of a pond or a river. Um, so it does like prefers moist soils that type of a setting along a pond edge um, or a stream. But again, as I've mentioned with a couple other plants, this is also very adaptable. It'll grow in average soils. And probably what it will do is it's not gonna kind of maybe grow as robust as it was if it had access to more of a consistent moisture source, um, but wonderful summer flowering shrub. You know, most of the spring and summer, you just have wonderful dark green foliage on a shrub that can get six to eight feet tall and similar spread. Um, that said, don't hesitate every few years to prune it pretty hard. It responds very well to pruning and will grow back and flower beautifully for you. Has these clusters, perfectly round golf ball sized clusters of little flowers all jam packed um, into this structure, this inflorescence. Um, there's actually one uh, cultivar out there called Sputnik um, because I think they, people thought it resembled a, a kind of a satellite up in space. We're here just to show you that uh, terminal inflorescence or structure that holds all of these beautiful clusters of flowers and you see how dark and shiny that foliage is. Full sun, the part shade is best. Um, after the flowers go by and then the seeds develop, they form almost like a little nutlet. It looks like a, almost like a type of a, a, like a sunflower seed, but much smaller, skinnier example of a sunflower seed, but just clusters of those that are adored by birds like goldfinches, pine siskins, birds like that, that look for these um, plants. So not only are you providing nectar for butterflies and insects, but then you're providing a food source for birds and other wildlife. One of our later native shrubs um, to flower is summer sweet, Clethrolinifolia. Um, this along with the Cephalanthus also prefers um, kind of swampy wet soils is where you find it in the wild. You see here, it's an understory shrub typically growing under red maples, Acer rubrum. Um, it will get some size six to eight feet tall, has these wonderful terminal clusters of fragrant white flowers that you see here, beautiful fragrance. They open in August, sometimes into early September. So nice when a lot of things are starting to think about going dormant. Summer sweet is just kicking into full flower for us and a wonderful fragrance. I watched this shrub a lot when I was at the nursery and kind of observed at least probably 15 to 18 different types of butterflies that would nectar on this plant. Excellent yellow fall color on, on Clethra. Um, really wonderful bright yellow fall color. When I was at uh, Broken Arrow Nursery in Connecticut, we introduced a pink flowering form of clutter called Ruby Spice. 
Again, similar attributes to the species, except for the flower color, same fragrance, equally attractive to, to pollinators and insects. Nice, dark, shiny foliage, um, similar height, six to eight feet tall. The thing to remember, there are cultivars too. You know, a lot of landscapes can't tolerate a shrub that gets six to eight feet tall and will slowly spread by um, rhizomes and underground suckering type of habit. Um, 16 candles um, only grows three to four feet tall, much smaller, much more um, easier to contain in the limited amount of space. We have some growing here actually under the windows of our cafe building and it, it doesn't block the view from the windows and it makes a kind of a pretty uh, foundation planting. Probably my number one shrub for uh, birds is Ilex verticillata winterberry. Um, Right now, winterberry is all colored up. If you drive around the, the um, swamp areas in Maine, you're gonna find winterberry, bright red fruits, just loaded, the stems loaded up and down the stems. Um, it's a deciduous holly, so it's gonna drop its foliage. So then you're gonna be left with bare stems covered with bright red fruits. Wonderful to cut and bring indoors. Um, they last forever in a vase of water. They're, you, they're great cut and used in holiday arrangements. Um, you just have to beat the birds because the birds adore them. Things like robins, bluebirds, other types of thrushes, cedar waxwings, um, they adore them and they'll be in there and they'll just strip them clean uh, if given the chance. Like Clethra, it is a suckering shrub. You can see this, the bottom picture of its habit. You can see um, all the stems that this very mature plant has has produced, it can get big. This is one that probably gets up to 10 feet tall. But that said, every winter when we were at the nursery, we would go in and we would prune this severely because we would harvest the stems and sell them and in the holiday season. And then it would just grow right back to that height and produce same beautiful fruits. Just as examples of what you might see in the woods around here. Now, as with the clethra, you know, many people can't take necessarily have a plant that's going to get eight to 10 feet tall. Um, so I would suggest try red sprite. This one maxes out at about five by five as far as height. Um, full sun, part shade is ideal. When I was in Connecticut, our house there, I had red sprite growing as a foundation plant because I wanted to see the bluebirds right outside my window feasting on these plants, feasting on the berries. And it was just perfect. It was a wonderful foundation plant. Um, the thing to remember, because this is a holly, in order to get the fruit, you need to be sure you have both male and female plants. The berries are only produced on the female plants, but you need to have a male in order to get the pollination. And you have to make sure when you go to a garden center that you pick both and then just read the tags because Certain males pollinate certain females. So you need the right boy and the right girl to get the right pollination. Otherwise you're gonna be very disappointed. Um, and often many selections that have been introduced recently are coming from Southern states. And if you get a female that's been selected and produced in the South and you bring it up North here, the flowering may not overlap with like Northern male winterberries up here. So. If the flowering doesn't overlap, the bees aren't gonna be able to spread that pollen to the different plants. So just keep that in mind. It is a holly, you need boy and a girl. And nurseries now are getting really good about on the tag saying pollinated by X, Y, and Z. And then you go to that row and you buy the appropriate male. If you don't want red, there are other selections that have been found with yellow fruits, orange fruits, winter gold, golden, golden verboom. So you can really get some beautiful full, uh, fruit displays in your yard as well as indoors if you cut the stems. Mountain Laurel at Broken Arrow, we were known for Mountain Laurel. My boss spent most of his career hybridizing Mountain Laurels with materials that were found in the wild. This is a typical flower color, wonderful evergreen shrub. Um, its native range ends um, in, North, in Southern Maine, kind of York County, and then extends all the way down to Northern Georgia. Um, it's in the same family as rhododendrons and azaleas. They're very closely related, the ericaceous family. Here you see a typical wild population of mountain laurel. As they get older, they tend to get this really interesting twisting architecture to the stems. 
Um, you know, and it's a wonderful opportunity either to highlight those stems, but if you don't like, like that, it's a great opportunity to plant other maybe herbaceous perennials underneath ferns and things if you want to cover up uh, the bare stems, if that's something you don't want to see. Um, but it, it, it gets 10, 12 feet tall, similar spread, but most of the newer selections that are out there, they are there. really don't get much over six feet in height and spread. These are just a few examples just to show you the diversity of flower colors that are now available, mostly due to the work of my boss, uh, Dr. Richard James, uh, when I was at Broken Arrow Nursery. Um, you know, they have great names like Freckles in the left side to Sarah in the top, and then uh, Keepsake in the bottom with that pickety white edge to each floret that you see there. Partial shade is probably ideal for these plants. We did grow them in full sun, but they had um, consistent irrigation on them at all times. And they love well-drained acid soils. And that's with most things in that uh, ericaceous Mount Laurel Heath family, um, rhododendrons, they want acid well-drained soils to really be happy. And this is one that has more of a star shaped flower called galaxy. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of our first shrubs to flower here um, in southern Maine is Lindera benzoin spice bush. Most parts of this plant, when you crush it or scratch a stem, has a nice spicy aroma. Really nice foliage, dark green, very few things bother the foliage. It's a big shrub. It can get eight to 10 feet tall and wide, sometimes even bigger, um, but really responds well to pruning. Wonderful fall color, kind of like the clether, bright, bright yellow. Partial shade, it is an understory plant, so it, it does fine in kind of high canopy shade underneath trees that have been limbed up quite high. It's wonderful in that type of a setting. The female plants, there are male and females. They produce bright red fruits that are adored by birds. They're the size of a, a small olive, I'd say. But this is kind of why we want to grow um, spice bushes. We want to see our, some of the leaves curled over like this. And you want to go in and carefully open this, this leaf up. And you're going to find this really interesting caterpillar inside it. This is a young spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. It has um, the coloration almost of a, like a bird dropping, but also these are fake eye spots that you see here. Mm -hmm. And then when it's alarmed out of the top of its head, it shoots these little these yellow horns that come out of the top of its head to try to scare off predators. And then it also uses all this silk to pull the leaf over to kind of conceal itself. All methods of the ways that it tries to protect itself from being eaten. So we carefully put the, the leaf back over because it's gonna to continue to grow. And then we come back, let's say in a week and a half and it's gonna be fully mature. And this is what that caterpillar turns into. So who wouldn't want to attract this beautiful caterpillar to our yard? Um, and they really don't cause a lot of damage. They may eat you know, a handful of leaves in the time from a small caterpillar to this size, which is about two inches long. The head is at the bottom of the slide, tucked in here. These are big fake eye spots. And doesn't, wouldn't you think if you were a nosy bird poking around and you were flipping that flap of leaf over, you would think maybe this was um, like the head of a snake or something and be startled and, and fly away. And that's the, the idea is people think that these, these markings are intended to, to ward off a predator and, and frighten it. Just a spectacular caterpillar. Here's the adult spice bush wild tail. This is great one. If you have horrible soil conditions, full sun, many things won't grow. I would say try bayberry. Bayberry will tolerate those types of conditions. Um, you see it growing all along seashore areas um, where a bright sun is ideal. It does sucker, so it will form um, colonies of stems. Um, sometimes in some areas, it's, it's somewhat evergreen. The foliage may turn kind of a plumish tan color. Um, but many people, we wanna grow it for um, these fruits. Again, like the winterberries, male and female. So that's something to keep in mind. And unfortunately, nurseries still haven't started to sex the different plants when you buy them. 
So if you want to, you know, beat the odds, you want to buy a few of them at a time and hope you get both male and female plants because it's these fruits that we want. You know, you crush the stems or the fruits, they have a really wonderful fragrance to them. Um, these fruits are super, super nutritious. Um, really important bird food um, for particularly overwintering birds because these fruits will persist in the winter. So many of our birds that are lingering around the coast and in our region in the winter are looking for food sources when the um, you know, temperatures are dropping, they need to get that energy. They get a lot of very, very important energy from these fruits of the bayberry. Bayberry can get very big. It can get up to 10 feet tall or more. But the thing to remember is every few years, you can go and literally cut this down to a foot or 10 inches, mow it if you want to, and it'll grow back to its glory in three or four years. Um, so just keep that in mind if you do need to control its height. Here's just an example, a yellow rump warbler that sometimes will overwinter along the coast here in Maine. It'll be looking for plants um, like the bayberries to get fruit from if they can't find insects. There's a typical height when it's not been pruned. And here's a habitat you can see along the coast. All that gray you see is bayberry growing with red cedars and, and junipers and such. Blueberries, fantastic, um, not just for bird food, for the fruits, but early flowers um, for our pollinators. These are probably some 60 to 70 year old blueberry bushes growing in the wild. Love the architecture that they get on them. Just wonderful kind of twisting, gnarly stems that you see here. Wonderful fall color. Another alternative for Euonima salatus burning bush. This is also in the ericaceous family, so well-drained uh, acid soils are ideal. Look at that fall color though, just amazing, bright, bright red. But here are the, the flowers, typical blueberry-like flowers, kind of look like the flowers of the bear berry that we saw, all in the same family. Here's our friend, the pine elfin, that we saw nectaring on the bayberry, also looking for early nectar from the blueberry flowers. And then the fruit later on are very, um, feed many bird species, you know, things like uh, the Orioles go for them, um, but many birds, you know, and the birds don't seem to mind. They just start to change color of those fruits to get a little pinkish cast and the birds are eating them. Um, so if we do want to enjoy them, we probably need to put some sort of protective netting over them. Um, but wonderful native shrubs. You know, and those plants, just to show you, they're not fast growing, the blueberries. You know, those big ones I showed, like I said, were probably easily 60 years old. So it is a slow growing shrub. Native dogwoods, um, you know, this, the native range, this is just getting into southern parts of Maine. But one of, uh, you know, southern parts of New England is just a glorious native flowering tree. Um, you know, in June, it's just glorious with its flowers. And then these fruit clusters, you know, it's a wonderful small tree to 20, 25 feet. Birds love these fruits again, you know, high in nutritious migrating birds you'll see coming into these trees and getting lots of food before they migrate, you know, to Southern climates. Um, thing to remember, you, you know, often when these are, are planted, they're planting it right in the middle of someone's yard. Um, but this is actually in the wild, it's an understory tree. So it does tolerate, you know, high canopy shade um, and still flowers well. It's not gonna probably be as dense as you would see it in full sun, but just keep that in mind that if you do have more shade than sun, it's worth giving it a try. Here's some appreciable fall color that you can get on the, the native dogwood. And then one of our larger trees, just to touch on a, a bigger tree is black cherry. Um, cherries are often overlooked. It's a wonderful um, timber tree. Uh, and you see a wonderful, as the older stems get this beautiful bark, nice dark, shiny green foliage. You know, it'll get 40, 50 feet tall. Um, early clusters of white flowers that are, uh, you know, many of our early native bees flock, you know, go to. And then followed by fruits that are highly nutritious and very popular with birds. 
but it's also a main um, host plant. So something the caterpillars are gonna feed on of many native butterflies, things such as our tiger swallowtails, our coral hair streak friend that we've seen. Um, interesting thing with the coral hair streak, they will only lay their eggs on cherry trees that are size of your pinky. So cherry trees are one of the first trees that um, you see in fields that are allowed to return to forest. They're what's considered a pioneer species. So that's one of the first things um, are cherries that return to that type of uh, a meadow that's being allowed to revert to forest. And a lot of times those cherries are thin and that's where you would find the coral hair streak. And those are the cherry trees that it requires to lay its eggs on. You can see right in the middle here, that is the egg, that little round disc. And then the very interesting caterpillar of the coral hair streak. But just to show you the diversity of creatures that feed on black cherries. These are different types of caterpillars of moths. This is called a crown slug moth caterpillar. Just unusual alien looking creatures, aren't they? Hmm. Saddleback moth caterpillar. You don't want to touch this one. These are actually stinging spines. But all of these things you would find here in our region, growing, feeding on cherry trees, if you just take the time to look on the foliage. Or how about this magnificent Cecropia moths? Those are our big, one of our big silk moths that have like the five, the five and a half inch um, diameter, you know, wingspan. The caterpillars, they're like thickness of your thumb and maybe three to three and a half inches long with these marvelous colors that you see on them. And one of their main food sources are cherry trees. They're, they're not quite as selective of others, but you will often find them on cherries. Look at that, just amazing colorations on that caterpillar right here in our backyard. And that's the adult moth. If you're fortunate enough to occasionally maybe attract one to your porch light, um, just a beautiful, like I said, five inch wingspan. And then one final um, dogwood. This is an understory tree. This is um, a great one for that high canopy shade situation, moist, well-drained soils. This is the alternate leaf dogwood. Um, taxonomists decided to start changing the names of some of the cornice. They now this one's called Swida as the genus. Um, this has a very horizontal branching pattern to the tree. The flowers are produced just above the foliage. So it has almost like a pagoda-like look to the, the habit. Um, those flowers are then followed by these beautiful fruits that become a wonderful purple coloration that you see here and are loved by different types of birds. This shows you the habit. This is a, a tree I had growing down in Connecticut with a kind of tiered branching with then the flowers up above the foliage. So very, very showy. Um, and that's an ultimate height. It's probably about 18 feet tall. You see there maybe pushing 20 with a similar spread. And I just included one conifer. This is our, our Eastern red cedar. Um, not appropriate for all yards, but if you have the space, I would include one. They're great um, for their fruits that you see here, the beautiful blue fruits that are produced um, that are adored by birds. But it's great um, to produce, um, to provide um, plants such as this for nesting for birds. Um, great spot for birds to escape being a chased by a hawk or some other predator. They can sneak in there and hopefully um, hide from being eaten. Um, and, you know, just great uh, native tree. They come, you know, particularly the seed grown ones, all different shapes and sizes. Any negative deer do like to eat them. So they will browse them up to a certain height, you know. Um, so if you do have a, a deer issue, um, that's something to keep in mind. But a wonderful evergreen conifer to include in full sun settings. Cedar wax wings up, appropriately named feast on the fruits produced on, on, the, on these trees. And I hesitate to put in Virginia creeper. Um, it is a beautiful native vine, in my opinion. It can be quite aggressive, so it does need a proper location. I've seen it used really effectively growing over like a long rock wall where it can be contained um, and then just maintain prune back hard every few years. Um, I've seen it engulf trees, which is not ideal for the trees, obviously. <clears throat> but, you know, it has this beautiful dark green um, lobe foliage, you know, palmately lobed that you see here. But look at some of the amazing 
um, moth caterpillars you can find feeding on uh, those Virginia creeper. It's a sphinx moth, so it's related to our tobacco tomato hornworms, but the caterpillars only feed on Virginia creeper and grapes. But that's a big cat, uh, moth that's probably a three to four inch wingspan. And then the eight spotted forester caterpillar in the top turns into this beautiful day flying moth, similar to the one we saw at the beginning of the program with bright orange and kind of yellowy white spots on these jet black wings. For fall color, I, you can't beat a vine for fall color, Virginia creeper. Right now, the fall color, it's just, they're dropping its foliage, but it was just this neon maroon uh, red coloration. And then the vines produce these beautiful blue fruits that are then held on these bright maroon um, structures. And then the birds, you'll see if this is growing up a tree, you'll see birds all up and down the trunk of a tree that has Virginia creeper growing on it. Um, just devouring them because they're just so tasty to the birds. So it's, it's a fantastic vine if you do have the space and you know the means to control it and, and limit its, its spread, I would highly recommend including this vine. So that's the last of the plants. Um, looks like we have a bunch of uh, questions in the chat. I just, if you know you, if you are on Instagram, um, just to give um, you know my photography a little bit of a plug. I do tend to take a lot of pictures, mostly of, of plants. Obviously, working at a botanic garden, but then also um, insects and other things I find um, as I'm walking around the gardens or walking on paths and hiking through our region. And I, I include the hashtag observe connect experience because it's, I'm trying to make a point to people that we just need to take the time and really watch, look at our, our, our environment and our surroundings. Um, there's so much going on. And, you know, I, I think any benefit that came out of COVID would be that people got outside more and took the time to look around their surroundings. And I'm just encouraging to people to do that. Hopefully, you know, seeing my photographs encourage people to continue to do that and, and really look at the, the small things that are around us. Um, I think we're in pretty good shape. It's one o'clock, but I've got some time to answer questions. Um, maybe what I'll do is stop sharing my screen and we can go to the chat. And if there are people in the audience at the library, um, we can answer those questions too, to the best of my ability. Uh, thanks, Andy. I just lost the chat. <laughs> um, Lip, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great, okay. I'll look in my room here and call on people while, while Paulus is cleansing the chat. Okay. okay, I just found it, I'm okay now. Okay, well, let's see, we've got, um, yeah. Back there, and you've got to yell. Um, lately, I've been finding that there's a move in Maine to cut down black cherries and oak trees because of the brown tailed moth. Um, what do you think about that? I know it, it's a tough call. I, 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 I would not encourage that. I know I have some friends that have done that in their yards. They have a lot of young kids and they've reduced most of the oaks, at least the ones right along around their house. Um, you know, we contemplated, my parents have a cottage not too far from here on Damariscotta Lake. And we contemplated what we were gonna do because the brown tail was horrendous last year. And we were gonna, I was getting ready because they're elderly and they're outside and um, we were contemplating actually treating the tree, injecting it. And I hated to do that because, you know, injecting it with something that kills brown tail is going to kill any caterpillar that's in that oak tree, you know. And if we do that, you know, that's where all our migrant birds go. You know, if you're a bird watcher, you're looking up in oaks because that's where all the caterpillars are that the birds are feeding on. And we inject our trees. Um, we're taking out every cat, but those, those insecticides are not selected. We're just brown tail. So, um, you know, that's one way to get around using any kind of chemical is, is to cut the tree down. But oaks are such a valuable tree for, for biodiversity. If you've ever read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, 
um, or he just has a new one out, just all about oaks and the importance of oaks. He did research, he's a science a professor at University of Delaware and his, his folks down there did work and oaks were the top tree that um, attracted over, I believe over 580 different species of Lepidoptera, so there's butterflies and moths. Uh, caterpillars they found feeding on oaks. That, so, you know, I would definitely hesitate before cutting down an oak tree. Um, you know, we didn't treat that oak at my parents' cottage, and this year there were very few brown tail. It was, it seems in some reasons to be very cyclical, like you get it a severe infestation and then it kind of dissipates. So, I would lean towards not cutting them down. Um, we have more issues too with winter moth. I don't know if many of you are familiar with winter moth. That's not one that's gonna cause the horrendous rashes that brown tail does, but it's equally as destructive to eating foliage on trees. Um, and unfortunately we are up against it as gardeners with invasive insects insects that have been introduced. And we've got a couple on the horizon that are gonna cause some big issues to our forests here in Maine. The, the um, emerald ash borer that is coming and is gonna be, is here in parts of Maine. And then the spotter and lantern fly, which is really scary. That's in Southern New England and slowly expanding its range. I mean, when I left Connecticut, there wasn't an big ash tree left in the state. They had all been taken out by the borer unless you treated the tree, um, they were decimated. So I'm not really giving a great answer on that except that if it was my yard, I would probably leave them and you know, possibly hire an arborist if it was practical to come in the winter with a cherry picker and cut the nest out would be my first, even if it was an apple tree, I would do the same, get a big, big ladder and do that. And, you know, with smaller trees, you can be very effective with just coming in um, and, and pruning them out. And there are people now, I don't maybe you may have seen, they have created a drone now with a clipper on it. <laughs> people are now using that you can, and then it has this clipper that comes down and is clipping, you know, because many people can't, you can't get to a cherry picker, you know, to a tree. So I, God knows what the expense is, but there are options. And, you know, if it's practical for, to hire an arborist to do some work like that, that would be my first go is before I would spray, you know, particularly with a foliar spray when the caterpillars are out because then you're dealing with the caterpillars all over the ground, dead. And you're not gonna be able to play in your yard because they're all under the tree. So anyhow, <coughs> I went on a bit too long there. So Corliss, you wanna, you wanna uh, read out a couple questions from the chat? We do, can you hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, the first question is which native grass will thrive in clay? I've seen switchgrass do all right, panicum virgatum. I've seen that pretty adaptable in some pretty lousy soils. Yeah, possibly even big blue stem, I'm not 100% on that one, but I, I would try panicum virgatum first, I think. Uh, you also talked about quite a few berry plants or fruiting plants, and someone is asking if any of them are poisonous. Hollies are poisonous to, you know, some of the, like, if you grow some of the evergreen hollies. Um, so I would be cautious with many of those. Um, you know, the dogwoods too, I, they're at least out of, out of height. So, that, you know, with the, the winter berries, they're within range of, you know, like a child possibly eating them. So there, I would proceed with any of those plants, caution and whether, they cause bad harm or they just, you know, give you upset stomach or that type of intestinal troubles. Um, you know, I would just, with any of them, I would do a little bit more research. Um, usually 
going to even calling like the extension service and asking before using them. Um, you know, I've, we've had them here and in other yards and landscapes that I've worked with and never had any instances of people being harmed by them, but it's not something that you would go like, I wouldn't encourage people to eat like winter berry because of, it is a type of holly. I think you could be sickened by it. And, and one last question, almost last, uh, what about deer resistance? Haven't had any issues with deer eating winter berry. Um, I'm just trying to think what other, what other um, you know, blueberries. With blueberries, it haven't been an issue either. Um, that said, you know, everybody's population of deer are different, <laughs> it seems. You know, some, some yards they eat one thing and others they don't touch it. Um, you know, I don't know of any, except for maybe Andromeda, Pieris, that is foolproof as far as deer eating. You know, they say hellebores deer won't eat them, but in my yard in Connecticut, they eat them to the ground. Um, you know, and other people swear by it that they've never touched the hellebores. Um, and it just depends on the population, how big it is, you know, what kind of food is in the surrounding woods. Um, you know, I, I, most of the plants I showed today, I don't, there may be some browsing, but I tried to put ones in there that weren't favorites of deer. You know, like bayberry has that spicy fragrance. They tend to leave things like that alone if they have, uh, you know, those oils in the foliage or in the stems. Um, you know, some of the trees I'd be more afraid of, like younger trees of the, the males rubbing their antlers on them, causing damage that way. Uh, someone missed your Instagram name. It is um, Andy J. Brand, all one word. B-R-A-N-D. All right, and I think just one last comment, I think. Oh dear, no, there are some more comments. Okay. Petra Hall is telling everyone that Tom Schmeek, Schmelk, Schmilk, Maine entomologist, has a lot of information about how to deal with brown tail moths, not cutting them down, on YouTube. He spoke at the Belfast Library and has been on Healthy Options on WERU. And then Excellent. a couple of things. Great. Yeah, no, that's good. I'll, I'll check that out myself. Yeah, perfect. So, Carlos, can we have a question from the room or two? Sure. Oh, sorry. Why don't we end with the chat? I'll be done. Yeah, okay. So uh, any questions from the group? Take maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. What about suggestions for shallow rooted native plants to put on a, a septic leach field? Did you hear that, Andy? Yeah. Um, so I've seen, you know, some of those shrubs would be fine. Um, you know, winterberry tends to have a very fibrous shallow root system. Um, I haven't seen any issues with that getting into trouble with septic. Um, so that would be one, you know, definitely avoid tree species right around septics. Um, obviously willows are very aggressive. You don't want to do too many willows around there. They'll, they'll cause issues. Um, what else have I seen on some septics? One that I, I didn't mention here, um, it's not a necessarily one that's, it's more for utility than anything in screening. I've seen like near our septic here at the gardens is um, some of the alders um, is a possibility. But, you know, when in doubt, I would tend to probably rather than even shrubs, I would lean more towards perennials that like those regions to avoid any kind of possibility because any root systems depending um, if they're shallow even you know around septic there's always a chance that you could have some issues and why risk having to rip that all up and and deal with you know backed up sewer system okay thank you andy i think we better wrap up because we have another meeting coming up here in a few minutes okay thanks yep. a lot all righty thank you everybody Carol, good to see you. I see you there. <laughs> so.